Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. I am Halise Lieberman, the director of the Toby Center for Jewish Life and Learning in Warsaw. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's episode of TJHT Talks. We are thrilled that more than 1,400 of you signed up, registered. And for those of you who are joining us, we give you a warm welcome. And for those who are unable to join us, we hope that you will follow us on YouTube. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Georgetown University's Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics for creating and producing this extraordinary work. They are joined by their partners or supporters in their educational programming, which accompany the play by the Karski Educational Foundation. Our session will be approximately 50 to 55 minutes, and it, as usual, will be followed by a Q&A session with questions from you which we invite you to post in the chat section, in the comment section on the right side of your screen. We would love for, to answer all of your questions, but we will take as many as we can and then hope that you will revisit our website and our YouTube channel. <sighs> Two introductions. David Strathairn is a widely acclaimed actor known for his theater performances and his role in films among them Good Night and Good Luck, Lincoln, and most recently the Academy Award-winning No Man's Land. In 2014, in collaboration with Derek Goldman and Clark Young, Strathern first portrayed the title character of Jan Karski in the play Remember This, The Lesson of Jan Karski, which premiered in commemoration of Karski's birthday, 100th birthday. Derek Goldman is the chair of the Department of Performing Arts and director of theater and performance studies program at Georgetown University, and is the founding director of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics. He is an award-winning stage producer, actor, a director, playwright, and well-known among the theater world. Derek Goldman is the co-author and director of the monodrama Remember This Lesson of Jan Karski. Clark Young is a writer and teacher based in Brooklyn. He has been part of each of the each production of this play from Warsaw and New York City to London and Washington and beyond. A Georgetown University graduate, Clark went on to gain his master's at NYU Tisch School of the Arts, and he has since taught theater at Georgetown and Bronx Lighthouse College Prep Academy. And he is the co-author of Remember This, The Lesson of Jan Karski. David Schack, a director, producer, and dramaturg is a professor in the theater school at DePaul University in Jewish and Holocaust theater. He has his BFA from the Tisch School of Arts at NYU and Circle in the Square Theater on Broadway and he completed his master's work at Tufts University and his PhD, ABD, at Boston University with his mentor, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Elie Wiesel. It is now my pleasure and honor to hand the mic to my friend and colleague, David Schack. David. Well, thank you so much, Elise, and um, we are really in for a treat today. I want to uh, thank everyone for being here with us and just uh, want to start out with one regret that all of you who are with us today have not yet seen the show. And I know that you will after you hear our panelists, hear the creators, and hear about the incredible work that David Strathairn has done in this piece about this incredible man, Jan Karski. Uh, we will start with just a bit of a um, opening reel. And I want to ask Clark to give us an introduction to the reel. And uh, let's start with that. Sure, thanks. Uh, I think that the first thing uh, that's important to note is who Jan Karski is and was. Uh, Karski was a Polish Catholic 
who uh, served as a courier for the Polish underground during World War II. His job was to carry messages to the government in exile in France, uh, and, and when France became occupied, later London. Uh, in August of 1942, Karski volunteered to walk through the Warsaw Ghetto and a transit camp on the way to the, uh, an extermination camp in Belshitz. Uh, where he witnessed uh, the, the Holocaust and then went to the United States and to London to report to notable figures, allies and uh, Poles uh, about what was going on in occupied Poland. Uh, his reports, including to the, uh, the President uh, Roosevelt, as well as uh, Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden and Associate Justice of the Supreme Court Felix Frankfurter were denied, ignored um, and disbelieved. Uh, Karski wrote a memoir, Story of a Secret State, in 1944, which became a bestseller uh, before the war ended. Um, and then he chose not to speak about his wartime experiences until uh, Claude Landsman uh, interviewed him in the documentary Shoah, which was released in 1985 in the United States. Uh, and he taught at Georgetown University um, in government and foreign relations for nearly five decades until his death in 2000. So this uh, reel is an introduction to our play uh, made by our incredible videographer, Katarina. Uh, it's first stagings um, during the pandemic, uh, talkbacks, and the curriculum, which uh, Derek and I, along with um, our uh, colleague, Ajoma and Jaka, have built, uh, first piloted at Georgetown University called Bearing Witness, the Legacy of Young Karski Today. So please enjoy this reel. We have a duty, a responsibility, to do something, anything. And if so, how do we know what to do? So powerful, and so amazing, and so tiny right now. It sounds like Paris, looks like Paris, and feels like Paris. I thought you were young Paris. I knew him, I drove him home, I knew him. Also, thank you for continuing to tell this story. It's just really, really powerful to be back in the live theater with human beings, so thank you. For me, this is a lesson. There is no such thing as good nations, bad nations. Each individual has infinite capacity to do good and infinite capacity to do evil. We have a choice one-man show sort of cracked open this this communal theatrical experience of um, David and his scene partners, you all. The way he asked those questions and the vulnerability and the urgency really, really hit me right here. I really yeah. feel charged and empowered to, to really search for those answers. When we see things happen that are not right, to remember this and to do something. When everything looks hopeless, you're the hope. Made me to rethink things and I encourage me also to say this is not lost we need to keep having the conversation how do we change it how do we never forget we should be careful that we're not allowing it to repeat and that is where storytelling comes in it left that very much open it didn't encourage people to ask questions what what would you do what can we do yeah it's not like it's we don't have any power or it's futile to even try what is important is trying So here we have an incredible opening reel, and thank you so much for the introduction, Clark. And the opening reel, I think, gives you a taste of this. It also gives you a sense of the scope, to some extent, of what Derek and Clark have tried to do, and then bringing in uh, Mr. Strathairn into the work. So I'd like it. Perhaps, Derek, why don't you start off by telling us what is it that drew you to, to do this project? I mean, I know you're at Georgetown University and Jan Karski was there as a professor, but, you know, 
What is it that drew you to do this at, in this theatrical form? Thanks, David. It's great to be here and great to be uh, connecting with Toby Talks on this. Um, yeah, we um, uh, began in 2014. The initiative that I um, direct here at Georgetown is called the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics. So we have um, a commitment as it is to uh, the intersection of um, the role of performance and, and what we believe is the particular power it holds in relationship to uh, critical issues in the world, to issues of, of social justice, of magnitude, and of international relations. It's housed as a, as a joint initiative between our School of Foreign Service and our Department of Performing Arts. So it's unusual in some ways as an arts initiative housed in a leading school of international relations. And that's the place, as Clark referenced, that Karski spent his 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 life teaching. Um, so in 2014, uh, I was a faculty member here. Uh, there was a centennial celebration of, of of Karski's birth on campus, and I had had a you know, fairly deep background with Holocaust themed education and theater. And so colleagues at Georgetown reached out um, in connection with that and asked if we might want to put something together uh, in, in relationship to that centennial event. I think the thinking at the time, including my own thinking was, oh, right, a, a reading or some kind of, you know, something, you know, to commemorate the event. We certainly didn't have the journey that we've now been on for eight years in mind. Um, but, uh, the first two people I thought of are the people who are part of this event. Um, David, uh, who I'd had, you know, had built a relationship with um, through a shared connection actually to, to Studs Terkel, the great oral historian in Chicago and, and some past projects. But I just, uh, as a just long time uh, admirer of David's sensed that something about the spirit of Karski and the spirit of David as an artist uh, were, were linked or were connected. And Clark had been a really brilliant collaborator and former student um, who I was excited, you know, knew that I needed a partner to sort of think about and, and absorb this work with. But also right from the beginning, I would say this project had a, you know, Karski was a teacher above all. And so there was something about this being built as a piece about generational legacy and teaching and learning that made sense to kind of in terms of Clark's and my collaboration. So we began there. I'll just say that uh, it's been a long circuitous process in working in fits and starts. The initial reading that we did in 2014 was just a few days of rehearsal. And it was David as Karski with an ensemble of Georgetown students who played a whole range of roles. And the play stayed in that form through different workshops and iterations until 2019, when we premiered it as a solo performance as part of the School of Foreign Service Centennial Celebration at Georgetown, and then took it to London briefly. And the that's the version that we're now moving through the world. Um, we had lots of uh, like every theater project, we had lots of hopes and aspirations that were slowed down by COVID in terms of what was to happen after London. But as the reel showed, we had a chance finally to kind of premiere the play properly um, in Washington last fall and then in Chicago and are sort of moving it forward now. So that's the that's a kind of outline of the journey. Um, and I'll let others speak to, I mean, I, I'll just add one last sentence, which is that right from the beginning, as we encountered Karski's story, it felt to us as a team, like a play, not so much about a past history, but as very much a kind of current events play. Our interest has always been that we have felt that the resonance of this story speaks to, speaks urgently and loudly to events in the present moment and the questions about individual responsibility, about moral courage, about the status of truth, um, about what it is to bear witness, you know, uh, across our affiliation or identity and to, to be responsible for others. And so that's it's been a huge part of the journey has been, as Clark said, connecting with our students in a curricular way about those questions and how it impacts their own lives. Yeah, so um, clearly, you know, you being in Georgetown and everything that you said brought you to Karski, the centennial. Uh, I'm wondering also, though, how this story itself, because so few people know about Karski, and we really 
as a as a world community didn't know about Karski until the film Shoah, and even parts of Shoah wind up in your production. So I'm wondering, Clark, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, and then what was it that you were trying to do by telling the story of Jan Karski? Because I didn't know who the heck Karski was myself, and I had, you know, as Derek mentioned, been a student at Georgetown for four years where his statue sits and I'd walk by that statue and, and sort of never bothered to, to understand what it was. And, and that became, you know, an engine for how we were sort of disentangling this complicated history. Um, and it began with students walking up to a bench and a statue and asking a question and animating that statue and engaging with a history that they both didn't know, but perhaps carried subconsciously or unknowingly. So um, when Derek first introduced this, uh, you know, this, this play that we were going to, or at least stage reading that we were going to write, I started to pour over all of Karski's work, Story of a Secret State, his memoir, Tom, E. Thomas Woods, uh, Karski, How One Man Tried to Stop the Holocaust. And of course, we watched Shoah. And I had this kind of profound uh, guilt and confusion that I didn't know who he was, given what a poignant uh, not just emotional trauma I was witnessing on screen in Shoah, but what a complicated history he represented, both abroad, as I understood abroad, and here where I was sitting. And so we began to uh, figure out what were the essential parts of a very complicated story and how leanly could we tell it where we felt it both, it both honored and represented what he truly bore witness to the Holocaust and what he reported the Holocaust and how it could pop with the contemporary, you know, resonance of crimes against humanity that happen today that we think are of as far away or even just in our backyard that we don't deal with. So, uh, David, then you were brought into the project or somewhere in there you were brought in. So I wonder if you could talk about that and now how because to my mind you're the spitting image of karski it, it's just incredible not only what you do on stage but just the the ways that you inhabit him and in a sense he's kind of been you so you know is that something that you found by exploring the character uh yes yes david i did david yeah um I uh, just want to say thank you for doing this, the Talby Foundation. And, um, Elise, thanks so much for um, airing this, um, uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about this production. Um, it's, it's really an honor to be a part of it. Um, yes, the, uh, the Karski came in to me when I first saw a show in 1970, 80s, in the early 80s. I saw the whole thing in one sitting, and his testimony was seared into me. I was a fledgling actor at the time, trying to find my way around New York City. And I'd never forgotten <clears throat> what that um, and the feeling I had after seeing show in its entirety, but also. Uh, seen this man um, testify as to what he went through. And, you know, years later, Derek was uh, asked to um, uh, celebrate him at Georgetown University and he got in touch with me. And I, I thought, wow, uh, uh, something has been laying dormant for so long with me is now uh, possibly coming to life. And uh, I've, I felt that all along, uh, and I've always felt that the, there's a, um, <laughs> We talk about what is your responsibility as an individual? Do you have a duty? Do you have a civic duty? What is your um, uh, your role in the world? In, 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 um, when you see things that, uh, uh, well, sort of motivate you to speak. Um, and I, I feel that theater is a, a form where people uh, have, over the centuries, found motivation to speak about things that are particular to the human condition. And here was a, uh, a one man who was speaking to one of the most, uh, uh, to say it's memorable is putting it too lightly, but uh, e event in human history, a man who is bearing witness. Um, and 
I thought, well, what an incredible opportunity to use the 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 art of theater and of, of com gathering communally to experience things about ourselves with a historical event. And uh, I, I jumped to it. I felt this is uh, part of my duties, part of my responsibility as a so-called performer. And it's it's been in a it's it's been a searing experience. It's it's it's. Um, uh, every time I enter into uh, Karski's world, um, uh, it feels like the world is, uh, the floor is turned to jello and things are all in flux because what he speaks about is present, uh, has uh, been with us uh, as a species for a long time, but it is ongoing. The, the, the concept of bearing witness and sharing that witness in a communal experience so that people have a way at least to talk about um, and perhaps share and let's hope heal themselves through the kind of trauma that the Holocaust uh, affected the world with and continues to affect the world with, but not only the Holocaust, but um, traumas and, and, and critical situations that we go through today. So for me, it's been uh, a, a real privilege to be um, with this man and inspired by this man and urged forward by what he did with his life. Well, why don't we get to one of the scenes that we have queued up. Uh, we won't be able to show the whole play because it's uh, approximately an hour and a half, a little over an hour and a half. But um, we do have a couple of scenes, and I want to turn to Clark to set us up. We have a scene here um, that's about the um, uh, Bundes, Leon Feiner. And uh, Clark, why don't you uh, tell us about that? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's it's important to note that the Polish underground themselves didn't ask Karski to go to the Warsaw ghetto. Uh, he uh, Jewish leaders, including Leon Feiner, learned about his trip to London and sent secret correspondence asking Karski to meet um, in an old house on the outskirts of Warsaw, as he put it, uh, and not knowing uh, what he was being asked there for or what he was going to be asked to do. And this uh, small snippet from that sequence is uh, the Bund leader, Leon Feiner, asking Karski to walk into the Warsaw Ghetto. Hitler may lose his war against the Allies, but he will win his war against the Polish Jews. Young man, it has never happened before in history. Egyptian pharaohs did not do it. Babylonians did not do it. We have very little time. Unless the Allies take unprecedented steps, we will be totally exterminated. Now, we can organize for you to visit the Jewish ghetto. We can organize for you to visit a, a Jewish camp. Mr. Vitold, I know the Western world. I am sure it will strengthen your report if you are able to say, I saw it myself. Now, of course, you may say no, but I will go with you. I will make sure that you will be as safe as possible. Who knows? Perhaps this will shake the conscience of the world. Will you do it? So here we have a scene where Leon Feiner, who is a member of the Jewish Socialist Bund and who had also uh, fought in the war, but now is he's actually outside the Warsaw Ghetto. He's in the Aryan section because he's able to pretty much mask himself. But he then connects with Karski and asks him to go into the Warsaw Ghetto. This is so powerful and to see not only that people were working and, and that Karski was working to get the word out, but then also Jewish socialists were working. And we'll talk a little bit later about Shmuel Ziegelboom, but maybe, um, you know, Derek or Clark or David could uh, comment on that. And just the act of going into the Warsaw ghetto and being you know, face to face with, what was it at its height, over 300,000 Jews crammed into a space which was not much more than about two square miles. 
Yeah, Clark. Why don't you go ahead, Clarky? Oh, uh, you know, I, I was I was just going to add that what, what struck me about this clip in this moment is is not is not just the specific ask of walking into the ghetto, but it's also the assumption. I'm sure it will strengthen your report if you're able to say I saw it myself. And I'm wondering in my mind, as I think about that in a contemporary sense, whether that is still true and, and whether or not it was true in that moment, right? I'm sure it will strengthen your report if you're able to say I saw it myself. And so Karski makes this, th th this decision in that moment to, to, take, to take this on, you know, and to quote unquote do his job um, and, and then, and then what becomes complicated once he does, once he enters that space, um, which he, you know, refers to as a nightmare, um, and, and he ha literally has to clean himself having left it sort of subconsciously just cleaning himself uh, outside, um, before he returns to Warsaw, that he's taking on more than just what his job is. He's taking on a kind of responsibility that even he can't comprehend. Um, and, and while Feiner does know this, I think on some level, He's trying to tell him, you know, we need, we need you. And that, 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 that's remarkable. That's remarkable. And, it, and it's a real, I mean, you know, it can't be emphasized enough that he's a Polish Catholic. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily know what's happening, right? And so there is this kind of notion of allyship or just connected humanity of understanding that this is a person asking another person to walk in and see what people are doing to other people. Yeah, what I also, um, I, I was thinking about that as well. Here's a Polish Catholic who is working for the resistance and then on his own, basically, to go into the Warsaw Ghetto and then later to go into, he goes into uh, Chelmno as well, and he documents that. So what was it about Karski that kind of drew him? It seems like there was something, I, I don't like to bring up fate, in these kinds of situations because it makes it seems there's some kind of destiny uh, that it's all planned. But what was it within Karski's psyche that brought him to do this? That's a search that uh, is uh, ongoing. Um, as I try to, you know, ascend the mountain of the man that what was that motivation? What in that moment spurred him to say yes, where another person might just be so, uh, uh, just, you know, would, would say no, would, would, would not do it. I mean, even today we come down to these points in our own personal lives. Do you bear witness? Do you, if you see something, say something, you know, it's a, kind of a trite phrase, but it's a really critical phrase. Um, do, you, do you bear witness? How do you bear witness? And when it comes down to that moment, what says to yourself? Well, how do you say to yourself, yes, but no? I mean, and with, with Karski, I believe that it was a kind of innate faith, but maybe more of an innate sense of humanity that he learned as a young man because his mother was a, a woman of a very, you know, influenced, I, th I think, him deeply. Um, uh, you know, everything she taught him as a young man um, came forth in that moment. And uh, he made a choice. But, you know, I think we all have in us a, a kind of a, a well of empathy, empathy or sympathy or at least a, uh, an understanding of uh, hopefully of another person's uh, uh, what other people go through and if we can tap into that and access that then as Nancy Pelosi says we can we can see it and then we can act upon it and in that moment he made a choice to and and thereby hangs uh, his greatness well I think um also, uh, he lived, uh, my understanding is he grew up in Loge, and that was a community that had quite a few Jews, and he lived in a neighborhood where he actually knew quite a few Jews. So this may have, I mean, do you have uh, more to say about that? Was that? Did that open up something for him around Polish and Jewish relationships? Because Jews were very much a part of an ongoing history in Poland 
um, that continues to this day. I mean, it's an over a thousand year history. Uh, so to think of Jews in Poland as some kind of separate people, which at times they were in a ghetto sense, but coming out into a modern time period, they were very connected to the socialist movements, to the urban life, to the cultural life. Uh, so Karski must have been part of that, don't you think? Uh, Eric, do I want to talk to that? Or? I was just going to, I mean, his best friends in school were Jewish, as you're saying, David, and there's a, um, a section of the play where he speaks quite plaintively, remembering those friendships and conjuring the fact that he never knew what happened to them, that there was a a part of his life where they were the central figure. So I actually think that's a very wise and deep read, David, of like a something that was that's connected to how, as well as what David's saying about his mother and the sense of devotion that he that she passed on, which I think is was a key word to him: devotion and its implications in terms of faith. Um, Karski was a figure who th talked about himself as a camera. He resisted any sense that what he did was heroic, was any different than what was kind of called for in, in a sense of duty or service in his own sense of himself. He saw himself in many ways as a failure, which is part of what the play kind of chronicles. But what we, what we see, I think, in this moment, the will you do it moment is the moment in which all of those, that sense of self and of duty and of service and of the different things that that make a massive, you know, that nod that David does as Karski in the play, which is his yes, is in one way of thinking about it is the microcosm of the entire reason why we're here telling Karski's story, you know, that, that choice changes history. And I think one thing that we were very interested in with Karski's story is how while that's a very extraordinary moment that most of us don't get in our lives of being say, uh, having that question, will you do it put to us there? The legacy of what Karski then taught for decades was versions of for students and young people, what is your responsibility? What will you do when you are asked, when questions are asked of you, when, you're, when your neighbor uh, is, um, you know, is turned against or when people say, you know, great crimes start with little things, he says. So there's something for us about why the play and Karski story matters now that this question of will you do it, what will you do, is really kind of central uh, to, um, to the way that this particular story of individual responsibility, it's these moments where our values, our histories, who we are, surface and it's all of those factors i think how we were brought up what we've experienced but also what we're willing to risk what what we're willing what cost we're willing to to have it have it bear well i want to get to our next clip which i think is not only about what you've been saying i, I think it connects to that but then when one receives the information of what is happening in an atrocity in a genocide, in racism, in anti-Semitism, then what do we do with it? And it's very complex. And so, uh, Clark, why don't you uh, set up our next clip? Uh, now, Karski is in the United States, correct? Yes, yes. Karski had been in London reporting uh, and then uh, didn't know he was going to the United States and eventually landed in New York in uh, 1943, went to uh, DC where he stayed in the Polish embassy. Uh, he learned that, uh, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Felix Frankfurter, who uh, is Jewish, uh, wanted to meet with him. Uh, and in on July 5th, on July 4th weekend, uh, Frankfurter arrived at the Polish embassy with only the ambassador, the Polish ambassador Karski and Justice Frankfurter in attendance. And Karski uh, walked him through what Karski had walked through, which was the Warsaw Ghetto and the transit camp in Izbica Lubelska. And this is his response. Young man. I am no longer young. I am a judge of men. Men like me, talking to men like you, must be totally honest. And I am telling you that I do not believe you. 
Polish ambassador breaks in. Felix, what are you saying? He was checked, rechecked 100 times. Felix, he is not lying. Mr. Ambassador, I did not say he was lying. I said I do not believe him. These are different things. And my mind, my heart, are made in such a way that I cannot accept. I know humanity. I know men. Impossible. No. 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 Now, this is so interesting because here we have a witness who has documentation, who's able to relay clearly what is going on with the genocide of Jews now speaking to a Jew. And this man is one of the most powerful men in the country. He's on the Supreme Court. And yet, (laughs) there's complexity here to this because Frankfurter is the third Jewish Supreme Court justice, the first Louis Brandeis, went through so much when he went on the Supreme Court. And then Benjamin Cardoza, not as much, was pretty much acclaimed when he went on. He was appointed by Harding, I believe. No, Hoover, Hoover, sorry. And then we have Felix Frankfurter. And once again, there was a lot of anti-Semitism that came up and yet he was still approved unanimously, but still, It must have been difficult for Frankfurter. It's so interesting what he said. I did not say that he was lying when receiving the information. I said that I could not believe him. There is a difference. What do you think the difference is? Or the difference that he's trying to pinpoint? I think he is um, he's pinpointing the the place in a human psyche that uh, is um, at once fallible and at once um, uh, uh, well, the opposite of fallibility, indomitable, that you can choose to, if you're presented with a, a, such a, a, a horror as he was, that reflects some basic inhumanity of, of man how do you reckon that is it possible to go on in your life with with that knowledge and applying that knowledge to your next day or do you ignore it because it's almost too impossible it's it's too much to bear and it can shatter your shatter your belief in humanity. So I, I think it's 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 right there, and it, it's it's like when Karski said uh, was asked, "Will you do it?" Yes. You ask someone, "Can you believe this? Are you uh, are you able to believe this?" Yes or no. And I think that 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 points to a, a lot of what's happening to people throughout the world now. Can you believe what is happening? Do you deny the facts or can you accept it? And if you do, how do you move forward? Yeah, I'm wondering, um, Derek, when you were adding all of these other characters, I had seen an earlier version of it, uh, probably one of the earliest versions, and then other characters started to be added in. So I'm just wondering, we could get into the mind of of you and of Clark in adding these other characters other than Karski and how they also now are characters of the play, which David plays so brilliantly, clearly delineating between all of them and yet still maintaining that um, Karski being on stage. But... What about these other characters now and how you did that? Yeah, I just want to, just to put a, maybe a pin on the Frankfurter conversation, just building on what Dave was saying. It's just so striking to me in how much the Karski story has, how people often, this is a conversation they want to have right afterwards. And there's something about the, the, 
the question gets asked, what does it mean to know? And this idea of knowing and not knowing, which I think is another way of naming the kind of the tight precipice that David is describing, how we know and how we know and deny the same thing at the same time as human beings as we to move through the world and to survive that, I think becomes a big theme. I think in terms of your question, David, about the, the shape of the play and other characters, um, Karski was himself a great storyteller. He was a man of the theater in a sense. He was a, the, you know, the one of the beauties of the building this pros, this play over the years has been that, you know, Karski taught on this campus that we are at. So there are many, many people who've been part of our kind of extended community in developing this play who were his students uh, over decades who recount the stories of not only what he shared in class, but how he shared it, you know, cigarette in hand and, you know, the, um, and so in a way we were, our process was less about, you know, extending a gallery of characters and as Clark was saying, really staying lean to the essential figures of Karski's narrative um and the, the there there were people who he conjured all the time because especially as he started in the later part of his life to kind of tell the essential story and so these um uh the characters really there were earlier versions where there were many more characters but now it feels like we're at a point where the characters really are prismatically like an extension in a way of the kind of core Karski story. And I feel that one of the amazing, you know, David is, is um, an amazingly modest and humble person, but one of the amazing, it is, it's a misnomer to me that David that is playing just like the amazing achievement of this solo performance is actually that the transformations and the etching across these different characters, um, which to me becomes part of the vision of the production is that we see, you know, we see at once a full spectrum of humanity. We see the Nazi officer who tempts Karski and seduces, you know, him in a way. And then we see the beat, we see the, the, the person doing the beating and the person receiving the beating in the same moment. And that gives us a window into something beyond what typically one actor playing one character can. And I think that's part of, for me, the power of solo performance as the vehicle through which we're kind of getting such a range of, a range of, of human characters. I think, yeah, I just I want to say, yeah. Yeah. oh, go ahead, Clark. No, I was just going to add that I think that we also give David uh, the, only the tools that Karski himself had to, to do his reporting. Uh, and, you know, there is no record of Frankfurter really discussing that meeting. There is no record of Roosevelt discussing that meeting. The virtuosity of Karski's photographic memory, his ability to report um, the clarity and um, the precision and the lack of bias with which he does it is embedded, I think, in the writing style and the performing style of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and and it really is Karski teaching what he did and what he witnessed. And it's important to also mention that uh, Karski was 28 at that time when he met Felix Frankfurter, right? And so there is this sense that after that 35 years of silence, Karski goes back. Now I go back, he says in the in the Shoah uh, in the beginning of the Shoah clip. And so we're witnessing someone both now and then. We're witnessing someone with a remarkable ability to report and to tell the truth. And we're left to deal with what that truth means to us, just as Frankfurter was. Yeah, well, I think that uh, leads us very nicely into our final clip that we have. Uh, but just one more comment on the multiple ways that, David, you inhabit not only Karski, but these other characters. I mean, I really see your performance as so, I couldn't imagine any other actor doing this. To me, the physicality and how you inhabit them, and also how it just is a um, a performance that goes beyond the words. It it, it really becomes this uh, almost like a, a holy event. It's like what Grotowski, the great Polish theater lab director, said that the actor is a holy actor who is there to be a representative for all of us who are watching 
and yet feeling that we are there as well. We are present in what you are doing in this almost religious way. Uh, but I want to get to uh, Ziegelboim, who was in London. And uh, once again, I'll ask Clark to help us uh, set this up and tell us a little bit about Shmuel Ziegelboim and then the really uh, tragic circumstances that you have within the production. Yeah. Yeah. I think in this case, it's important to not just say that Karski met with Ziegelboim in 1942 uh, in London, Ziegelboim being the, the Bund uh, representative on the National Council for the Polish government in exile. But it's also important to say what comes after that meeting, which is that Ziegelboim in 1943, shortly before Karski meets with uh, Frankfurter and Roosevelt, uh, uh, commits suicide in protest um, and leaves a, a, a very elegant suicide note about um, going with his people and joining in profound protest of the action in which the world watches and permits the destruction of the Jewish people. Uh, and so this clip is actually from the meeting between Karski and Ziegelboim uh, prior to all that in 1942. So what can I do? What can I do that I am not already doing? I do everything. I do everything that is possible. So what can I do? I close my eyes and I give it to him. Jews are dying. There will be no more Jews. What's the use of having Jewish leaders? Let the Jews go to the most important offices, allied offices, and let them demand. If they are refused, let them go out. Let them stay outside and let them refuse drink. Let them refuse water and food. And let them die. Let them die a, a slow death and let humanity see it. Who knows, perhaps this will shake the conscience of the world. And then he jumps. Boy, boy, this madness, 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 madness. They are mad. The whole world is mad. They are crazy. They don't understand anything. They will not let me die. They will send me to policemen. They will arrest me. They will, they, will, they will take me to asylum. They will feed me artificially. They are mad. Everybody is mad. So I have to do something. But I don't know what to do. So what do I do? I have to do it. But I don't know what. So what to do? This is a mad world. I have to do. I don't know what to do. So what do I do? Yeah, so the world is mad. It's all madness. And what do I do? And Ziegelboim is watching while the world is not doing anything to stop the genocide of the Jews. And I think he feels it so much not only because of the horror, because as a Jew, he sees the destruction of his people, and even the Jewish people themselves are not responding in the ways that he wants. He says that very clearly. He says, you know, they should starve themselves. They should self-immolate, basically. Are they doing that? Yeah, what was that like to, um, to present that? And, and, and to, I mean, this was a whole new character for me when I saw the production this time, and I thought it was brilliant. So thank you, first of all. I think the inclusion of Ziegelboim is something that has uh, the, most, um, the most searing uh, uh, relevance to, uh, as, as we found uh, um, in, in some of the talkbacks, uh, searing rele relevance to today is that here is, a, uh, he is, he is uh, what Ziegelboim was going through is, is probably what a lot of people are going through. Uh, we have to do something, but what do we do? I don't know what to do. What can I do? People should be doing something. But, and he, he, it's almost as, he, as if he's left alone out there, um, uh, stranded. 
with his passion and his, his the sense of urgency. And yet he, uh, and, and he feels uh, that it's futile. You know, I, I think, and, and, and this I think speaks to a lot of uh, what's happening um, to, to people uh, today. A lot of students have asked, what can we do? And I think the inclusion of, of Ziegelman was a brilliant uh, um, on part of Clark and, and Derek to bring him in because Karski refers to him. He said that, uh, you know, he never spoke about the war in his classes, but when he comes to the war experience, there was Ziegelman. That is of whom he speaks, because it, it, that that ex, that moment with Ziegelman, I think, was just um, Karski carried with him the rest of his life. So yeah, Clark, did you want to say something? I I, I was thinking this morning about um, one line in particular that that David really advocated for entering in from one of uh, the oral histories that we. We had with uh, um, where Karski talks about meeting with Ziegelboim, where he he interrupts Ziegelboim. Ziegelboim could go on for hours, really, and and is is quite uh, caustic with Karski, and he's thrown by that because so many of these meetings are in elegant rooms uh, with cigarettes and, and 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 drink, and they're brief because perhaps no one cares as much as this person. And Ziegelboim finally finds someone to to speak to, and Karski interrupts him and says, "I'm going to be late for my next meeting," and he says in a way that he considers that a form of moral corruption. So here you have someone who is trying to do his job, which is to meet as many people as possible and tell the story to as many people as possible. And the one person who really is listening, who as he says, I know this already, he has to cut off and say, I need to go. And in that way, he feels morally corrupted. It's such a unique perspective, I think, on the politicization of, of you know, civic servants and those who try to do the best of their ability, um, but but for whom it, it's impossible to complete. Well, I want to be able to get to questions. We have uh, quite a large audience here, and uh, I want to ask uh, Halise to come back on as well. There you are. At least I can see you. I never know with these platforms who sees who. Uh, and I want to um, see if people can put questions in the chat. How do you spell Ziegelboim? That's an easy one. It starts with a Z, I E G E L B O J M. And actually, you can find multiple spellings of his name different ways. Um, and also, I found out that Karski had changed his name as well. It wasn't. Karski originally. Uh, so like many Jews, he changed his name. But I know not just Jews change their names. But um, yeah, let's see. Um, what do you do? What don't you do? What's to be done? Um, how do people respond to that? I mean, I think I'll, I think we are often asked, you know, we ask these questions in the play, you know, there's a framing device, which is really meant to kind of, um, and it's, it's not a sort of hollow, I don't think it's a hollow just dismissal of to say, well, it's not our problem, you know, but I think that what we also acknowledge is that answers in any clear directive way are very, you know, that there's something about the like, and I think for Karski as a teacher, there's something about the like seriousness and intensity of grappling with those questions with a sense of individual responsibility. We're all situated in different ways with different paths to what we can do that's meaningful. Some of us have more access to different kinds of, you know, some of us are artists, some of us are civic servants, some of us are in the United States, some of us are in Poland. There are different circumstances. So trying to kind of offer a, a, a reduced message of here's, you know, that's, I feel like, but to, but to offer in the spirit of Karski a sense that, um, you know, governments don't have souls, individuals have souls. Those souls are tied to questions of individual responsibility and to try to, you know, to make sure that we aren't complicit <coughs> in 
<laughs> not knowing and the kind of habit of walking past the Karski bench that, that and just saying, well, this isn't my, I'm in my own world. I'm on my, and that there's some attention uh, that's connected to individual responsibilities. For us, what we think this play is trying to invite. And so it's been really inspiring to grapple with that, especially with, you know, young people with students who are inheriting, let's face it, a world, you know, <laughs> that has been a lot to surmount. And so for that, to hear from them what this is leading to for them or the connections they're making and the questions it's making them ask um, feels to me more like the point than uh, any ability we would have to give a clear, you know, distilled answer to what we, what can you do? Well, I think this is one of the challenges when we see something. I mean, we're starting to see something on the, it's not just on the horizon. I mean, it's like right here. I mean, Elise, uh, your work is in Poland. You're in Poland. And uh, now on the horizon is uh, quite potentially could be uh, one of the biggest military actions that's happened since World War II. Um, and, you know, we, we try to, send our minds back to what it must have been like in 1938 and 1939. And we try to think, oh, we would have done something. We would have, you know, done something either to get Jews out or we would have done something to stop Hitler. We would have done something to not give the Sudetenland or uh, to put a, a stop to it. You know, sanctions, are they gonna be enough? I mean, how do those of us who don't have power influence those that do have power? This is, you know, and then how do we, um, as individuals, and I think Karski puts it so well, you know, the state and then the individual, it's somewhere in there. It's between that, that polarity. One of the, oh, sorry, David, go ahead. No, please, please go. Please, I, I, I just think. wanted uh, to say that many of the questions that we're seeing, and you can see as well, are about how do we bring the play to us? And us happens to be all over the world. We're talking about Costa Rica, we're calling other parts of the United States. So I think that one of we will all share how that might be possible. They'll, we'll encourage people to get in touch with you, Derek and, and Clark, and uh, because clearly the, our audience for whom we are very grateful, is expressing a very clear need about bringing this play and all it means to stages in their own communities. So thank you very much. I, I was going to say, at least just to follow up on that, that there, I noticed these questions of uh, how will there be access to the play. Um, but there is also, we also did a film capture of the play um, and that hopefully will be released um, uh, very soon, uh, probably, um, or hopefully this, this summer sometime. But uh, the film has been uh, uh, trying to find its way out into the world. Um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, I, just, I just wanted to add that to answer a lot of questions that have been um, put into the, uh, um, in, in the comment section that uh, it's our hope that it will be get out there um, and that we have, uh, that we can take the play to as many places as possible because as someone said um, in their chat that it's time to invest in our youth and in respect uh, and honoring Karski's legacy since he was a teacher we feel that that's perhaps the most fertile and most important vital place to give this information because uh, um, it's new to a lot of people it's and especially new to young people and for them to be able to to look back into the past and, and apply his lesson to their present that's uh, one of our main intentions and indeed one of the most vital uh, things that we will hope will happen well and also seeing how it relates i mean it's what derek said earlier on is that this is very much today and we see this here in the United States, the rise of nationalism. I mean, just today in the New York Times, I saw an article about neo-Nazis marching and disrupting a bookstore in Rhode Island and stopping them from doing a reading of the Communist Manifesto because they felt that that was anti-American or whatever they felt. And of course, the 
organization that did that, the group that did that, I hate to call them an organization, uh, but these um, really uh, insidious people believe that Jews are taking over the world. I mean, that's one of the core beliefs that they have. So the um, basic premise of racism, of nationalism, of globalism, underneath all of that is anti-Semitism. So there's, I mean, this piece has a, a relevance that goes into every section of the world and very much so in the United States, I believe. Yeah, I just, just that's part of why, as David was saying, why, you know, we're, we're very committed to this as a theater piece, but it can only get to so many people and places. It's a theater is, is local that way, right? right? We're in this city, but, um, and I think the um, opportunity to work with, you know, the um, award-winning producer Eva Anisko to shoot this film as we think about the long-term trajectory of this story uh, was for us, uh, a, we hope will be a help in getting it, you know, to quote unquote, the places where it's most needed. Of course, it's needed differently in a range of places, but even as we look at the U.S. journey of the project, we recognize that, you know, we're, if we're performing in you know, cities with, you know, at, at kind of elite theaters in urban centers, we're going to be reaching a certain kind of audience. And in the middle of the country and in other parts of the country, there are opportunities to have a different kind of conversation. And so it's really important to us, both with the play and the film, to be thinking uh, as we've been developing the curriculum, to really be trying to think about um, the various, I think, need manifests in different ways. We're very motivated. There's, you know, we've had some uh, plans in the works to try to bring the, the performance to Poland. We still hope very much to be able to do that. Um, we do have plans to bring it back to Washington, D.C. later this spring for a couple of weeks, and then um, plans in the works for a New York run in the fall. So those, but we see those as catalysts really for uh, getting it to a whole bunch of places that may not be the familiar journey for an off-Broadway kind of production, but really are about, for us, about impact and about really wanting to have these these conversations and, and certainly keeping an eye on, you know, this is, the play felt very relevant in 2014, but every time we've returned to it, there have been new urgent feelings of of what the, of what's happening around us or what's in that day's news that it evokes for people and you know i don't think unfortunately that's going to be that's going to change anytime soon yeah i see a question that's um i think a really interesting one in both this the question itself and then brought more broadly how much studying of the history of the shoah did david have to do what were testimonies or stories that influenced him the most to prepare. So what influenced you the most? And, you know, you must have spoken with survivors as well and with other witnesses. So, uh, you know, what did influence you and, and what, um, you know, kind of brought the, the this character to life for you from those stories? Everything stems from um, Karski himself, uh, what I witnessed watching Shoah, uh, reading the story of the secret state, uh, having the privilege of meeting people who were his students and, and knew him um, and uh, everything that he wrote um, and everything was written about him and it's his, uh, his speeches and, and his talks. Um, uh, it, it's been a, uh, you know, a, a, a huge reservoir of, 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 of information and insight uh, in, into who he was and how he carried himself and uh, how he was in the classroom, how he was in, in you know, in, in public, uh, his relationship uh, with a mysterious but somewhat uh, um, public information about his relationship with, with his wife, Pola Norenska. Um, all of that is, uh, has been my, um, uh, my, my, my sort of my, uh, has been my reservoir of Jan Karski to, uh, to, to tap. And uh, it, it can, it, it's like a cauldron that is continually bubbling. Yeah, I think this um, question here kind of goes off of that one as well is about the, the message of the life of Jan Karski is universal. Has the play been translated to other languages, uh, Polish, Russian, German, 
Chinese, etc. cetera. Uh, this can touch the conscience of people everywhere. I see a lot of questions about where, I'll just try to give as much. We will at the end share contact info to stay in touch about the project because there are things we just, it, we're still fairly early because of COVID and the trajectory of the journey of getting it out there. So there are things we don't know yet about who's distributing or how with the film, but the best way will be to uh, sign up with the lab to, and we'll we'll send regular updates. But I, I will share, um, we absolutely are committed to get, you know, the, the, the vision is that the film would be accessible and available once it's released in the, in the coming year. Um, the, we don't yet have translated versions, although we've been working to have the Polish translated into Polish first because we've been imagining a tour there. But certainly a hope, of course, is to bring the story internationally through the film or the play. Um, the play is published in English, so that's one, that's a good, Georgetown University Press has done a version of it. That's a, uh, that's, so that's a, a good vehicle to start from in terms of starting to try to get, um, get, a, get word out there. Um, so I'm just, I'm seeing a lot of questions. I wanna just reassure people that we won't leave you stranded with uh, in terms of information about where it's coming next. Great. Um, yeah, so I think we're coming near the end of our time. Uh, I wanted to uh, just give any of our panelists one final thing that they wanted to say about getting the word out is also important, but about now uh, Karski in relation, uh, the story of Karski in relation to what's going on in the world today. I mean, I think this is what's so pressing on people's minds. It's like so present, it's hard to even uh, bring them together, but still, you know, what about what's going on today and how we, we need to perhaps have a little bit of lens for the future? One, one thing I've been thinking a little bit about um, as we've spoken here is, you know, in, in working with a lot of students uh, in, our, in this uh, bearing witness curriculum that we're building, the unique aspect of Karski is that, that he both internalizes the failure of others, including nation states, and acknowledges his own failure. And I, and I think that one of the things that's really profound about that, that in this question of what can we do, to me at least, there's something very, very useful in acknowledging and trying to understand failure um, and dealing with it. Uh, and there are a lot of institutions that have been exposed as failures throughout this pandemic um, that are leaving young people alone and, uh, and, and without hope. And so I think this, in the same way that failure can be a, a very um, disquieting and, and traumatic uh, uh, you know, experience to mine, it can also bring a rebirth and a lot of hope. If we have the humility to look at some of these institutions that have failed us, and try to understand why they failed in the way that Karski helped us understand a moment in history that we as culturally um, failed, uh, perhaps we'll be less likely to do so in the future. And that's, I think, something that I've gained from my, you know, our, my experience with our students who apply Karski's legacy to climate change, allyship in terms of racial injustice, uh, disinformation spread through social media platforms, and of course, conflicts abroad, whether it be Afghanistan or it be, you know, in, in what's happening now in the Ukraine. And so, so I think that those, those questions of what can we do are, are liberating in, in and of themselves to ask. And I think it involves us mining the depths of our failures as, as individuals and as nation states to like really understand those more deeply. And I think that that's what Karski does for us. Yeah, I just want to add one quotation from this from the play that I think is apropos of some of the questions and, and some of the asks is that um, uh, Karski, when he says that governments have no souls, that individuals have souls, and that the the common humanity of people, not the power of governments, is the only real protector of human rights. We have to take care of each other. And in that call, that covers everybody's potential responsibility to
to their neighbor, to their community, to the world at large. And he says that. He learned that. He was one man who was answering that call of which he speaks. And I, I think that's, that's, the, that's part of the spine of our, our piece is to, uh, you know, present that. And then also the question that, that we decided to ask is um, uh, how do we know what to do? Because it's not easy, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not easy knowing. Human beings have infinite capacity to ignore th things that are not convenient. And if we reckon with that in ourselves, um, then our choices uh, are a lot clearer. Great. Thank I'll just, you so much. Yeah, Derek, Derek, please. No, no, I was going to really echo the same sentiment as David. The only thing I'd like to kind of widen that too, which is, you know, we have spent, um, as we've developed the curriculum, I, as a, you know, as a Jewish American contributing on this team telling this story, we've spent a lot of time, I think really importantly, building the bridge between Karski's story and students in a, from a range of perspectives in terms of all of those issues. And I think that that sense of that Karski is not an us versus them figure in any way of really this being a kind of a story about the common humanity. But I also think we'd be remiss in the context of this conversation to not name a tide of rising anti-Semitism in so many parts of the world at, at, in a moment that's connected to what we're living. We, we know that this, you know, never goes away really completely that it, that it comes back. And, um, and I do feel that some of the work of this piece and the power of this forum and the gratitude to the, to the Toby foundation and to this is, is to kind of try to contextualize some, <laughs> some of the ways that that, that, that kind of hate misunderstanding, um, you know, to have a new lens to understand what that is um, and to build some of the bridges um, of dialogue uh, and, and communication in lieu of the misinformation and the, and the hate and misunderstanding that's out there. So that does feel really critical to me as we, as we think today about you know, our neighbors in Ukraine and in other parts of the world, um, all of our neighbors uh, and and colleagues. So I just, the, the play, uh, yes, we've been at this for years, but it, 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 the honor of being part of telling this story always feels immediate and fresh with what's happening around us and the conversations we're able to have. And uh, so I'm grateful for all the comments in the chat and everything that sort of are surfacing some of those in today's immediacies. And grateful to you, David. Thank you and yes. Halise for, well, for having us. Yeah, to everybody. Halise, thank you so much for having us. We are, the Toby Center is delighted and very honored to have had this opportunity to have this conversation, which I hope, we hope is the, uh, the beginning of many. Um, clearly, your, we want to thank you, David, Derek, and um, Clark for your passion and for creating the play and it seems that it's a it's in process all the time, which is so important that we can help. It's shaped as you go. I mean, and it, that means that the message that you're sharing understands that it's it's of time, but of no time. And so we are very grateful for sharing Karski with us for his legacy and his lessons and also making it clear that it's on us as a recipient, as an audience member, that we leave this space with, I could do. I may not know what, but I can do. And therefore it's incumbent, as you've all said, on individuals to stoke our souls and to make uh, change for good. David, thank you for inspiring the program and for moderating it so well. And of course, again, to the lab for all of the investment. And we will share in our follow-up email how you can get in touch with the lab. If not, please write to us and we will cer certainly connect you. I want to also thank um, the Tauby Center team, the TJH Talks team, 
Jakub Wyszczek and Kaya Szczek for making TJ's Talks session what it is. And we're grateful to all of you, dear audience, who are here with us, who have been part of this conversation. We hope that you'll join us in the future. For those of you who are supporting us, we are very grateful. And for those of you who would like to have this program continue, your support would be most welcome. We hope that uh, you all continue to be part of the Toby Center programming. And we look forward to seeing you in March, on March 23rd. Um, again, thank you to David, Clark, and Derek, and David. And in the meantime, please stay well, and stay safe, and stay strong.